Oh, there we go. Okay, we got something. I just had to stop it and start it again. Previews there. We're good. Stream health poor. Why? It says it's poor, but it's working fine. So I'm just going to go. Yeah. You ready? Yeah, man. All right. Going live. This may take a few seconds. All right. We're live. What's going on, everybody? I know this is kind of uh, delayed here. So I apologize um, for the delay. But um, we are excited to talk about some fun cyber news here. Um, I know that, Andy, you brought this to my attention yesterday. And uh, mm -hmm. it's it's honestly a little laughable, right? It's, it's kind of funny when you think about the... The uh, the news we're going to jump into today that you have cyber criminals who know what's going on, not just from the hack side, but then knowing, oh, hey, I just hacked someone that's supposed to be compliant. So now I'm going to get at them on the other end. Right. I mean, do you want to share a little bit about just how this came to your attention and then we can kind of dive, dive deeper yeah. into it? Um, the the impetus of everything these days. Right. LinkedIn. Uh, I was on LinkedIn and Tyson Benson, um, who's a, a cyber cyber legal legal, excuse me, cyber legal expert um, that um, I met years ago, made a post about, um, you know, uh, an entity being breached and essentially uh, the, the threat actor that got in um, notified the SEC who they were under from a compliance standpoint that they had not properly reported the breach. Um, right. And it's up. That's what I'm talking about. Michael <laughs> Scott would say. Um, so yeah, no, I mean, it, it honestly is, it's crazy. So, so just preface this for anyone listening. We're not trying to breach shame here. We're not trying to say Correct. to anyone, Hey, you know what? You're, you're dumb for uh, not reporting the cyber right. crime, but there's a couple of things we want to touch on both from the cyber insurance perspective Right. And I think also from the MSP sales perspective. So like if you're an MSP and you're adhering to a framework or you have clients that are supposed to be adhering to mm -hmm. a framework, I think there's kind of a double, a, a, kind of a double approach here, both from the response and recovery side, but also from the cyber preparedness side and kind of what your role is in helping to facilitate uh, the conversations with your clients around incident response. So uh, yep. first things first, let's, let's actually take a look at, at this article. Cause I think, um, That'll, that'll help share, you know, provide a little bit of context to what we're talking about. So if you see the highlighted piece here, um, I think I can zoom in a little too to make it a little bigger. There we go. So the attack was last Tuesday, November 7th, according so I don't know if it's alpha or it's supposed to be alpha V or if it's alpha like upside down A. So it's also alpha or I, black hat is another good name for this. So we'll just yeah, let's go with that. That's easy. Yeah. yeah, sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so they are a ransomware actor. And effectively what they did is they hacked this company Meridian Link, right? And because, and if, if you look up here, uh, they are the provider of a loan origination system and digital lending platform for financial institutions. So right off the bat, financial institutions, we see FINRA, we see uh, SEC regulations, you see all sorts of um, compliance requirements that exist. I mean, Andy, I don't know if we've talked about it, but before coming to Fifth Wall, I was actually working in financial advising and mm -hmm. I hated it. Um, I didn't hate the financial advising itself, but one of the things that drove me crazy, and you know, I, I think you can appreciate this, and if you're listening on LinkedIn, you could probably appreciate this too, is that the SEC is so regulated that if I posted something on LinkedIn and we had a um, basically a compliance team that vetted every post that got posted on LinkedIn. So if I posted anything on LinkedIn that didn't fit mm -hmm. within a very, very specific, you're allowed to say this, you're not allowed to say this framework, right. they'd take it down, right? Yep. So it was it was extremely locked down. So that just gives you kind of an idea. And that's what I hated about it, right? That, I'm a, that just gave I'm me anxiety. Anybody that follows me on LinkedIn knows that I would never survive <laughs> under those yep, parameters. Exactly. You I, would literally... have, I, would have, I would have zero posts in the last month. <laughs> You wouldn't have been able to post anything like all that content nope. you post, what I'm posting, That's like right. all that stuff. They would have been like, no, no, this is, this is no good. Yep. Um, so it would have been just, you know, five people would like it and then it just disappear off LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So um, that was kind of the challenge. Uh, that was for me as a creative, as kind of a goofball, you know, mm -hmm. not to be able to be my personality. So that was, that right. was challenging. Right. But that gives you kind of an idea yep. of just how specific and how intense um, the SEC regulations are. So mm -hmm. uh from there um and that's just for social media posting right so right. 
sure. take that and now apply it to, oh, you've been hit with a data incident. So, mm-hmm. so, and, and if you're providing loans, that means you have private information. You probably have social security numbers. You probably have all that kind of stuff because you're doing credit checks for all these clients right. if you're a loan provider. Um, so there's a lot of data to be lost, right? So Alpha, V, Black Cat, whatever, they, they hack the system and it says the attack was last Tuesday. November 7th, according to Alpha V, like they did not encrypt. Any, I was going to call it the mobile the, name. The bad guys, um, <laughs> according uh, they, to the bad guys. So they didn't encrypt anything. So it wasn't a ransomware attack, but mm-hmm. they did exfiltrate files, which means they stole information, which means mm-hmm. it could show up on the dark web. Dark web so it's right. kind of, I mean, standard, standard affair initially. Right. right? Um, but here's, here's an interesting part. And maybe you can talk to this, talk maybe real quick before I go into this next piece or i guess i can say this first according to alpha no security upgrades were made following the discovery so they didn't change anything right, right. so let's talk mm-hmm. the insurance angle real quick if you mm-hmm. suffered a data incident mm-hmm. what do carriers expect of you post incident after after the whole recovery piece or after your data has been recovered claims been closed is there expectation following that in terms of security and what does that look like what have you seen before yeah, absolutely. I mean, of course, they're going to want you to make some type of adjustment, right? Old coach, right? <laughs> I mean, I've, I've used the word, uh, the phrase, uh, make an adjustment over and over again. And the carrier is going to want to see, hey, we, we acknowledge this, right? Um, and we also, uh, number one, uh, have done our due diligence on finding out where it came from, what our weak points were, how can we improve more, moving forward to make sure it doesn't happen again, you know? Um you know, imagine jumping in a ring with Mike Tyson and taking a first round knockout and then uh, scheduling another fight a year later. And, and you know, the media coming to you and saying, well, what have you done since, uh, uh, you know, you, you fought Mike last year and going, I've been sitting on the couch eating Cheetos, just hoping it goes better this time. <laughs> you know, like yeah. I, you, they, they, they want you to see they want to see that you, you've done something and taken the proper steps to make sure that the event won't. Yeah, I mean, we've used graphics in, in slide presentations before. You know, in like the Simpsons opening where Bart's writing the same mm-hmm. sentence over and over again on the chalkboard? Right. I always think of it that way where yep. uh, the carrier's like, what did you learn from this experience? Because you got in trouble. What did you learn from right. this experience, right? right. And, uh, that what did you learn piece has to actually be something tangible. It can't just be, hey, I learned not to click a link. It's like, no, actually, I'm taking security awareness training much more seriously Mm -hmm. now or something like that, right? So they want to see updated security posture so that something bad doesn't happen. So that's the first red flag here is that the Mm -hmm. the Black Cat had access to the system. And then I'm guessing because they were able to see that no security updates were made after the discovery, they were able to get into the system again, right? I mean, that's the only way you would know. They'd be like, hmm, the door that we used to get into the system is still open. So that's good. You know, like that's, I mean, it's good for the hacker. It's not good for the, for Meridian link. Right. And sure. that's, so there's, there's that piece there. Now, um, this is where, where, uh, things start to get a little more interesting, right? So data breaches, which is this website, they actually reached out to black cat and they asked whether they had contacted them at all or responded to them at all. And was told that someone from Meridian link had reached out to black cat at some point, but there was no interaction between the attackers and the firm. And when asked why not, the threat actor says, explained it just says they are offline which whatever that means right but then things get fun right so they now black hat has to seemingly reported its victim to the sec so that's where the as michael scott would say the turntables right so um this is this is different right and i i think it was uh i'm just looking back here in the in the early comments when we first posted this LinkedIn Live, Jordan Silva said a bunch of a bunch of cyber snitches, cyber snitches. Yeah, which sure. I think is hilarious. It's right. it's funny. It's also probably pretty frustrating from a from a client standpoint because you are especially SEC related, so you're required to right. um, probably. I mean, I don't I don't know all the SEC regulations around this, but. Um, if you look at that, the, the little dot that got filled in, I don't think I can highlight that. So mm-hmm. um, you can kind of see my arrow there, right? Material misstatement or omission in a company's public filings or mm-hmm. financial statements or a failure to file. So mm-hmm. I'm not, I don't know if that technically has to do with data breach, but I'm guessing, um, oh, I, they, they explain it further down there, right? So they fa- failed to file the, the requisite disclosure under item 1.05 mm-hmm. on form 8K within the stipulated four business days is maintained. So hilarious yeah. to a degree i mean not funny because they didn't report it but hilarious right. that the the that black hat actually looked into 
SEC regulations, and now they know. All right, right if we if we breach someone who is uh, is subject to the SEC, we know that based on this in this form, they only have this amount of days, four days, to report this, and apparently right. they didn't. Right. right. So that <laughs> uh, they they decided, hey, you know what? We're not going to report this, and um, Black Cat said. They basically told on them, like like Jordan said, a bunch of cyber snitches. Right. They they went and snitched right. on the person they attacked. Now that's ironic, especially mm-hmm. because they also hold a bunch of sensitive data. Correct. Right. So I mean, it's I I just think it's that's that's probably the the laughable piece. Um, just looking at the at the at what Black Cat did. Um, but also I think it. I don't know. I I don't know what you think. It's just in my mind, I look at that and like, okay, this is actually, um taking it kind of to a new level right yeah that's uh so um i i mean since you've got the sound bites today i'm I'm wondering how come we don't have uh you know aladdin and princess jasmine on the carpet singing a whole new world because that's <laughs> i mean essentially that's what it feels like right i mean we've got I could probably find um, it we've got new cybersecurity regulations across the board right um uh ftc um this is sec right but the the federal trade commission ftc expanded their definition of what a financial institution is this summer on june the 9th right so we've got a whole sector of folks uh car dealerships realtors <laughs> colleges and universities that are now defined as a financial institution they have their own cybersecurity rules they have their own filing regulations which just by the way came out right so a lot of these people that um, have been transacting business a certain way in a profitable way, right? Um, for many years, uh, now all of a sudden are waking up in the second half of 2023, going, "Uh oh, like I, this is I, this isn't this is a whole new world for us, right? Mm-hmm. Like we don't. I mean, mm-hmm. this is we have we have processes that have to be in place. We've got controls that we've got to put in. If something bad happens." Who do I call? What do I do? You know, there's man, Ghostbusters. Who are you going to call? You got, see, there's all kinds of opportunities. We, we really should have planned this better. But anyway, um, Wait, no, that's, I got a I response mean, to that one. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Anyway, but yeah, a lot, a lot of very profitable businesses, right? Yep. That have for a long time held all this data um, and have maybe not done it or let's let's I mean again not breach shaman right but maybe they have not made the investments in cybersecurity that they should have based on the amount of data and the type of data that they have now all of a sudden it's like hey we got to take this seriously and uh you know part of that is is if you do have something happen then you, you can't it can't we can't sweep it under the rug anymore right it can't right. just be this elephant in the room like you got to stand up like a big boy and go hey um we got hit um, and this is what we're trying to do to make sure that our clientele uh, is protected and that everybody knows exactly the steps to take. Them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that that's where we kind of see a, a little bit of a disconnect, right? And I, I just want to point out something really quick, right? It's the only part's a little sketchy about this. So they have screenshots that like Black Cat sent, right? So you have this screenshot of, hey, they filled out the form in order to um, report. Right. And then you have this confirmation, but there's no more of the screenshot there. So I don't actually know. Maybe they had this little screenshot already and they also just went online and filled out the form and pretended Mm -hmm. like they did it. I don't actually know. And that's the thing. Like, I don't have access to SEC um, reports and whatnot. So maybe they didn't actually file this at all. But I think the takeaway here is kind of twofold. One, the client is required to maintain a very high level especially if you're a compliance focused MSP. So let's talk about the MSP sales side and then I want to pivot to the insurance piece. So the SEC or the, the MSP sales side, right? If you have a client who is required to adhere to a framework, I mean, this is a, this is a no brainer case study for you, right? This is an opportunity for you to say, Hey, look, I know that there's a lot, there's a lot when it comes to compliance level stuff. I mean, I like, I mean, if, our buddies from like Jacob Horn or someone was on here that he could list off every one of the controls from uh, CMMC one, two, and three, right? So there's right. all those all those levels, NIST controls, CIS. Like there's there's so many things. But then if you're HIPAA required, if you're required to follow HIPAA or the FTC or SEC, like there's 
there's a lot in there that I think the, the average person, myself included, would not understand how to implement or do or, or handle, right? right? So you as an MSP, to establish yourself as kind of the leader of a particular framework can really add a lot of value. Um, right. it, takes, it takes time to, to study it, but then you can push it and you can push it using case studies like this to say, hey, look, I know there's a lot to it, but look what can happen. So not only are your systems hit where you are recouping from data loss and, and ransomware and all the, all the, the costs that come with that, but then also on the other side, um, you now have to worry about things down the road, right? And this is a potential issue. So let's shore up your security now so that this type of thing doesn't become an issue. Let's make sure you're aware of the guidelines when an incident happens, how it's supposed to be reported. And, you know, the concept of sweeping an incident under the rug because it doesn't seem that bad. Um, to Meridian Link's credit, um, it uh, where was it? Uh, yeah, here. So safeguarding our customers and partners information mm -hmm. is something we take seriously. Meridian yep. Link recently identified a cybersecurity incident that took place on November 10th. Upon discovery on the same day, we acted immediately to contain the threat and engage a team of third-party experts to investigate the incident. And based on our in investigation to date, we have identified no evidence of unauthorized access to our production platforms, and the incident has caused minimal business interruption. That's great, but it doesn't necessarily mean you don't have to report it, right? And that's the... <laughs> that was, that's I was about the, to say, we haven't challenge. lost any money, but we're not 100% sure about your data, and we didn't <laughs> tell anybody. That's how I read that. I mean, you know, again, not, not shaming, Classic but I PR mean... Move. Let's, let's get through, yeah, let's get through the PREs. And I mean, the way I read that is, it's like, hey, we haven't taken a, a monetary hit from it, but we sure hadn't filed it like we're supposed to. Right. It's just that <laughs> that mindset of we're just going to put uh, that nice little PR statement yep. out there, which you see in a lot yep. of cases, but it doesn't really provide any details. Sure. And so there's there's that whole there's that whole approach and, and, and piece right. there. So um, that's from the MSP sales side. You have the opportunity mm -hmm. to say, hey, here's a case study. Here's an actual event of why having these security controls are important. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we have other ones that we're, we're happy to help walk you through. Uh, if you just reach out to one of us, we can easily get you a case study, but this one is recent. I mean, this is from like two days ago. So November 15th, right? So, um, really important, uh, to, to see the framework. And I know there's a lot of MSPs out there that are already adhering to a framework and that's awesome. Um, use case studies like this to add, add kind of more, more of a foundation to that framework. Say, so here's why it's important. One, you're required to do it. Two, apparently the bad guys now know what the frameworks it, uh, it require as well. And if you're not adhering to it, they're going to tell on you. So there's that piece too, which not only now are you recovering from a cyber attack, but you're going to get fined by the SEC if this is true. So have fun with that, right? So let's shore it up. Let's make it good. Let's work to make sure that you're in a good spot now. Um, you know, I, uh, this is kind of a tangent, but it'll, it'll connect. About 10 years ago, I was in debt up to my eyeballs because I was an idiot. And I went through Dave Ramsey's financial piece. Um, huh. And, you know, he, he always says, uh, live like no one else today so that you can live like no one else tomorrow. Right. Mm -hmm. And kind of thinking that way with the business, shore right. up your security today. So yeah. this kind of stuff doesn't happen to you yep. later. And then, yep. uh, and so many people um, from my experience, and I'm sure you've experienced this too on the insurance sales side of, um, oh yeah, I'll buy an insurance policy after I've gone through a data incident. Right. So it's like, why wait until it's made real for you and you have to recover? Yeah. Um, so that's my thought on the MSP sales side, but sure. let's pivot it to insurance. And I want to, yeah. you know, hand the invisible mic over to you. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about um, why having an insurance policy is so important for things like this. Yeah. Um, uh, and I mean, approach it. Yeah. To, and, and to kind of go back to go forward. Um, to the MSP side of it, you know, as as the compliance and the MSP's involvement in compliance, that that dovetails with insurance nowadays. It didn't for the longest time, right? Like if we weren't sure. rewind back to 2018, 2019, if you had a compl chief compliance officer or somebody on your staff that handled compliance services, right, and they were walking a hospital through a HIPAA evaluation, right? there was no opportunity to go, oh, by the way, the insurers are asking you about these same because they weren't. I mean, they were asking, you know, are you a pot shop? Are you in the adult film industry? You know, what's your revenue? Yeah. How many employees? And then we were just writing policies left and right willy nilly. Right. 
Um, so the good old days. One of the things that we come across in the MSP world regularly in the wild, and part of what I do in my job every day is I talk to MSPs. I ask them, do you have somebody internally? And all MSPs are at different spots in their journey and maturation, right? Do you have somebody internally that specifically handles compliance, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if that's a yes, right? Um, it, I mean, my, my brain immediately goes to uh, my good buddy, Warren Balcom, that's in Little Rock. Warren will regularly call me and say, hey, I'm working with this group. They fall under this. We're working on X, Y, Z. Um, is that going to help them on their insurance? And I mean, 90% of the time, the answer is yes to some degree. Yep. If it's multi-factor authentication, if it's if it's backups, right? Uh, then yeah, it's gonna it's gonna ha help massively, you know. Um, so that's kind of you know in these scenarios, right? Now that we have regulations. Um, what entities, let's go to the insured side and let's talk about the insurance impact, what they need to understand. I, I see particularly as a resident of the South, when we talk about ransomware and we talk about a breach that because we don't understand it, right? It's a complex yep. thing. What I see a lot is kind of this posture of, well, if we don't negotiate with terrorists. I would never pay a ransom. Right. And and we've heard that over and over again from our government regards to terrorism and things like that. So we kind of take that posture. Right. And they focus on the ransom payment. Right. Um, honestly, if you are a highly regulated industry, the, the last thing you need to worry about is whether or not you would pay a ransom. Right. The average ransom payment right now as a whole is seven hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. If you're lower in, in revenue, you most people can negotiate that down to around a quarter of a million. That's not where your primary expense is going to come from. It's going to come from um, business in, uh, interruption, potentially, even though that wasn't a scenario here. It's going to come from a reputational hit. And, and we're the vast majority. If you are under a regulated industry, that means that you're holding some sensitive information. The vast majority of, of the expense is going to come from notification costs. If you operate in multiple states, every state has different notification laws. So you got to hire a breach coach and consultation to tell you how to appro appropriately notify to each state that you operate in. Yep. You have to set up a call center. You have to set up, you know, credit monitoring for those people for an event, you know, amount of time. And man, that can really compound. I mean, we've seen, depending on the industry and what's held, we've seen estimates anywhere from like $45 a record all the way up to like $125 a record. Yeah. You got. 50,000 records do the math, right? Like it, it can compound gets ugly real quick. very, very quickly. And that's yeah. where insurance can be helpful. Like, I mean, if you think about, we said whole new world, how this thing's changed, right? Before insurance wasn't asking the questions, compliance wasn't really tied with insurance. Well, now it is. So not only as you become more compliant, are you becoming more insurable? But then when you actually garner that insurance and you're under compliance and you have to notify and you have to report, right? Insurance yeah. now will pay you back in that if you work with somebody who's a cyber specialist that'll help you quantify out that risk, you should have appropriate insurance to help you pay those third party costs. Yeah, I agree. And you know, something you brought up and and maybe we can we have about five minutes here. Maybe we can yeah. um uh just take this angle. So one of the biggest uh I think misconceptions with cyber insurance is oh, it's just a little fender bender. You know, yeah. I'm going to sweep it under the rug and I don't want to file a claim because I don't want my rates to go up. Right. Right. And I I think on the one hand, and this, this kind of shows it, right. I mean, they acted pretty immediately. They were like, Hey, you, you had four days, four days <laughs> later, you didn't report it. This is whatever, but it, it's a, right. it's, it's reminiscent of a much larger picture, which I think is you do not know how long out the cyber event is going to last. That's right. right? As the MSP, you know, if you're, if you're like, Hey, we'll clean up your systems. We'll do this kind of stuff. So let's say you did a perfect sweep. So the client said, I don't want to file a claim. I don't want to bring insurance involved because I don't want to risk a premium increase. You said, all right, I don't know why you bought that policy if you don't want to bring insurance in, but whatever. Right. So you can do that. And then, um, now you as an MSP, because you're rock solid, you're amazing. You have now wiped their system. There is nothing. There's no, no entry point for that threat actor anymore. Nothing has gone wrong. That doesn't mean they don't still have the data. That doesn't mean right. they don't still have the ability to leak that data. And that also doesn't mean that your client is now not going to face 
too many double negatives. Um, your client it potentially means that your client is going to deal with lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit. Correct. When the reality strikes that they swept a data breach under the rug, and now clients all have their data leaked, and it'll get traced back to them, right? That's so right. Yep. that's going to talk about reputational damage, right? I mean. Yep. Rather than bringing someone in early to say, all right, let's navigate this through the whole process, you're now waiting until things go real bad to have to pick up the pieces from your reputation. And that's that's where, where the issue is. And I think on my end, um, you, I always like to compare cyber to car insurance because I think people are mm-hmm. very aware of how car insurance works, right? Yep. Car insurance, when I, when I was on a trip to uh, Michigan, I was in a, a gas station parking lot, right? Mm-hmm. And... Um, we were trying to turn onto a busy road and there was a guy in front of me and there was a guy behind me, right? And the guy in front of me pulled a little too far out into the street. So he's like, oh, this is too busy. So he started to back up, right? So he started to back up and I was like, oh, he's going to hit me if I don't back up. So I started to back up and lo and behold, I hit the guy behind me, right? Right. And the guy gets out of his car. He's swearing up a storm. He's angry. He looks at his car and he looks at my car and he goes, oh, it's fine. Never mind." And we just got in the car and drove away, right? You know, immediately... <laughs> If everything's okay, but with a cyber right. incident, you don't no, no. like yeah. you don't know how far reaching it is, and that's no. not just like you might be able to go into your system and say, "Hey, you know what? Um, this is where the threat actor is, and we have a really good EDR system that has expelled them, so it's shut down. We're good." No. You might know that much, but when it comes to how much data has leaked, who has mm-hmm. to respond, who has to be notified based on state laws, based on regulations, all that kind of stuff. That's where it has the potential to explode. So you can't look at a cyber incident and simply make the judgment. Ah, it's just a fender bender. Everything's fine. Yeah, um, well, and not to mention, yeah. I mean, there's good stats out there from CISA that show that of people that have a ransomware event, roughly 40 to 45% of them have a second breach within the next two years. So, I mean, that's, yep. there's that as well. Sweep it yeah. under the rug and don't do anything. That's why we're seeing people get hit again and again. They're going to come back to the honeypot, right? And, to the and point. I mean, go, go ahead. ahead. I don't want to interrupt you. You go. No, 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 no. I was just saying to your point about people not using their insurance. I've got a good buddy. You talked about home or, you know, like auto insurance. I've got a good buddy that like, I mean, $90,000 car, you know, and it, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to file it. I don't want my rates to go up. You know, I mean, like, I mean, let's think, let's think about that. I have a laugh track because <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> let's, but I mean, like, think about that from a practical standpoint, right? Like right. we were in a hailstorm, and we had $8,500 of hail damage to our car, right? If I don't file that claim, how long is it going to take for my rates to go up by 8,500? I mean, that's like a, it's like a 4X increase on my rate. That's not going to happen in a year, right? So if I make right. that claim and I gain that $8,500, oh, well, it's 80 or 8,000 because of the deductible. But anyway, like I, I it's anyway, the, the financials are going to work out way more yeah. in your favor if you make the claim. Anyway, exactly. It's like, you know, maybe you pay a hundred bucks more a right. month but you get your $8,000 to maybe, yeah, right. maybe, right. It's not that right. So it's hypothetically. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, uh, any, any other final thoughts here, Andy, I know we got to wrap up. Um, but I wanted to make sure that we covered this incident and talked through what happened and yeah, I think we hit most of it there. Yeah, no, I, I just real quickly before we leave, if you're out there in MSP land and you do have somebody that's dedicated to compliance or you're talking compliance regularly with your, uh, with, with your clients, just, I mean, from a 10,000 foot view, make sure that that somebody is connecting the dots between compliance and insurability, right? Um, yeah. We see yeah. cyber pricing all over the place in the market. I mean, uh, we just ran one yesterday where, you know, somebody was at 40 to, you know, I think their renewal was like 40, 42 grand. And, you know, through benchmarking, uh, we had them at an average, they should have been paying somewhere around 25 with the controls that they had in place, right? So, Make sure that if somebody on your team is pushing into compliance and going, hey, yeah, you guys are good. I mean, we, we've we're fully we've got you compliant on cybersecurity and, and, and here's all the green boxes that we've said. Somebody ought to be going, OK, let's get credit for that on the liability side and a premium reduction, deductible reduction or higher limits that we need to get to to fully protect us. Yep. Awesome. So good. Um, so everybody, thanks so much for listening in. Um, we love jumping on here and, and doing this. Um, so, you know. If you see anything in the cyber news and want to share it to us so we can make a live stream about it and make jokes and have my, more Michael Scott sound bites, we're always happy to do it. Um, Andy, thanks for thanks for jumping on here today, too. And I apologize for the rough outro here, but uh, this is pretty much what we got right now until I figure out how to use the software better. But cool. Thanks, everyone, for listening in.